good to be here tonight. We're going to be in James chapter 1 tonight. James chapter 1. And while I was preparing today, I, I thought how the Lord's worked in my life over the last few years, and it's just amazing. I met Brother Wally in South Korea in 2016 when I was stationed there in the Air Force in Brother Lewis's church. And that was our first independent Baptist church. And, uh, you know, I heard all the stories, especially if you get them two together. You hear all the crazy stories. And, uh, you know, I, I heard all the stories about Madison Baptist Church. And I heard all the stories about Pastor Allison. And I heard all the stories about Bible college. <laughs> Never in my, in my wildest dreams did I think back then that I, that I would move here, go to Bible college, and stand here in the very pulpit where, where many have preached I mean, I mean, the Lord's work has just been done. Words can't even explain it. But, uh, I mean, the Lord works miracles. You know, and I'm a miracle here today. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things. You know, he, he, he took me. He made me a new creature. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And uh, I can't do this on my own, but I can do this with the Lord. And I'm just continuing to pray and, and uh, seek his guidance on, on what he'll have me do next. And uh, James chapter 1 is where we're going to be tonight. James chapter 1. So on, on Monday, we cel- my wife and I celebrated our 24th anniversary. 24 years of, of uh, pure bliss is what, what <laughs> Romans says. Dad, was it pure bliss? Yes, pure bliss. We'll go with that for right now. But uh, again, that's only by the grace of God and... And a couple of weeks ago, I got a phone call from a church in North Carolina that asked me to come out and preach this last weekend. So I said, yes, set all that up. And I went to my wife and I said, how about for our anniversary, we take a road trip to North Carolina? I hear it's really pretty there this time of year. We've never been, but it was. It was a good trip. Glad, to, glad that I had the opportunity to go there. And we are here today. James chapter 1, let's get into this. In verse 19... He says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, And continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Back up in verse 22. But be ye a doer of the word. Are you a doer of the word? Do you leave some things out? Do you do all of the word? Are you a doer of the word? He says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. I'm going to preach a message tonight. Do not deceive yourself. Do not deceive yourself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you. I thank you for this day, Lord, that you've given. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I I just thank you for uh, your blessings for the day. I just thank you now. I pray that you'll be with me. I pray you'll fill me with your spirit and let your word go forth, Lord, as only you can do. I just pray now uh, you'll be with us in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Do not deceive yourself. According to psychology, self-deception is one of the most common and popular escape methods that people use to prevent themselves from feeling guilty about a particular subject. People will deceive themselves in an effort to escape from something that they do not want to do something that they do not want to accomplish, or even something that they fear, so they want to avoid it. 
The definition of self-deception is this, to allow yourself to believe that a false idea, a false situation, or a false feeling is true. You're basically, you're lying to yourself. Deceiving yourselves, lying to yourselves, can be very disastrous to your life. Why is that? Well, if you believe a lie, for one, we ourselves as humans, we're more inclined to believe the stories we tell ourselves other than other people, rather than other people telling us whether they're true or whether they're false. We can look around in the world today. There is no truth in the world. There is no truth. Pilate asked Jesus 2,000 years ago, what is truth? People today still look for truth, but they can't find it. We have the truth in the Word of God. We have the truth right here in front of us today. Are you a doer of the Word? People constantly looking for, for, for truth in a pill. They're looking for truth in a bottle. They're looking for truth in things of this world, but they cannot find it. Truth is often what we accept as truth, what we believe as truth, but are you deceiving yourselves? Why do you think they're indoctrinating the youth in our, young, in our public school today? The BLM, the LGBTQ, the gender things going on. Hey, if they can get them to believe in that at that young of an age, they have changed a generation, they have changed a society, and before we're even aware of what happened, we believe these lies. We go on and we end up living our lives based around these beliefs, and it's a lie. And in the process, we've deceived ourselves. The world's constantly telling us to do what? Follow your hearts. Trust your heart. Do what your heart tells you to do. Go where your heart leads you to go. But we know that the Bible, this is contrary to what God's word says. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. All things, not one or two, all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You see, obeying God's word should be the highest priority in your life. If you're saved, you've been born again, you know you're going to heaven, obeying God's word should be your highest priority. A doer of the word should be who you are known for. We shouldn't obey the word of God just when it suits our liking. We shouldn't take a little bit of this and a little bit of that just because we like what it says and we leave what we don't like. We should be a doer of all the word, even if it hurts, even if it's hard. I've heard this saying, I've heard people say, well, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, 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 it doesn't matter if I believe it, it doesn't matter if you believe it. God says it, that settles it. Someone who was only a hearer of the word is deceiving themselves. Have you been deceiving yourselves? Have you been lying to yourselves, or are you a doer of the word? The Bible likens it to a man who looks in the mirror. In verse 23, he says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You see, the word of God is our mirror. It's to show us our true condition. What is our true condition? The fact that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners, condemned to die and go to a place called hell and ultimately cast into the lake of fire. But this is where we see God's great mercy, his great grace, his love. God didn't just let man go his, selfful, his own sinful way and prideful way to eternal judgment. In his love and in his mercy, God seek the sinner. He sought him out. He showed them their sin and called them to salvation. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So today I'm going to give you four Bible truths. And I want you to ask yourselves, are you deceiving yourself? Have you been deceived? Has the devil deceived you? Number one, do not deceive yourselves on salvation. Do not deceive yourself on salvation. Turn over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. 
Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And not everybody that says they're going to heaven is going to heaven. Not everybody is going to be there. Verse 22 says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name have done many wonderful works. Sounds like the world today, doesn't it? Many people trying to work their way to get to heaven. But just because you think you're going to heaven, just because you hope to go to heaven, doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Many will find out on this day that they're not going to heaven. Many will find out when it's too late, they will not be entering into the kingdom of heaven. You see, religion isn't taking a person to heaven. The church isn't taking a, anybody to heaven. You could be a member here and die lost and go to hell. You can be a member of every Baptist church or every church in Alabama. You could still die lost and go to hell. The church does not take you to heaven. But you say, preacher, I've been baptized. Baptism doesn't save you either. Baptism is, is that, that first step of obedience after salvation. It's, hey, I, 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 I agree with the, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I associate with that. I'm born again. I believe on Jesus Christ. It's an outward display of an inward change. It doesn't save me. That old dirty Alabama tap water can't save anybody. And then he says, and in thy name done many wonderful works. I've talked with many people and they say, when I get to heaven or when I stand before God, he's going to put all my good works on one side. He's going to put all my bad works on the other side and he'll tip the scale. And hopefully just maybe I'll have just enough to hang on and get into heaven. But that's not how it works. You see, salvation is and it's always been by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works. It's not of works, folks. John, uh, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way. If you think you can get to heaven by doing good works, you're wrong. In Acts 4.12, he says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Listen, if you think you can get to heaven without coming to Jesus, you are wrong, and you do not understand these two things. Number one, you do not understand how holy God is. God is a holy God. He cannot be around sin. He cannot look upon sin. When Jesus was on the cross, Jesus says, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus took on your sin and my sin on that cross, and God is so holy he could not even look upon Jesus as he died for your sin and mine. You also do not understand or you do not know how sinful you are. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. That sin separates us from a holy God. He tells us that there's a penalty for our sin. The wages of our sin is death. What we've earned for our sin is death. That wages. It's like when you go to a job. They pay you a wage. They pay you a salary. They pay you money. God says the wages of sin is death. But I've talked with many of people. They say, yeah, when I die, I'm just going to go to the grave and I'm going to cease to exist and that'll be the end. No, no, the Bible says death is a separation from God. In Revelation 20, 14 and 15, it says, and death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Folks, that's an eternal judgment. An eternal judgment away from God, away from Jesus, the one who died for us. You see, but God loves you. He loves me. He loves the whole world. And he doesn't want anybody to go to this place. He doesn't want anybody to perish. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died to make a way possible for us to get back to God and in heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Listen, folks, you can be here today and you say, I believe in God. You can believe in God and still die lost and go to hell. I've talked with many people that say, I believe in God, but they have to come through the Son. They have to come through Jesus Christ. They have to believe the gospel message. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, how Christ died for our sins. He was buried and that he rose again the third day. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Who died? Christ died. It wasn't Mohammed. It wasn't Buddha. It was Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the prophesied one, over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about his coming. It was him. He died for our sin, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And you must believe that he rose from the dead. I've talked with lots of people that say, I believe Jesus was a good man. I believe he was a prophet. He did many wonderful things, but I do not believe that he rose from the dead. Then I'm sorry, you cannot be saved. You must believe the resurrection. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be saved. Listen, all I'm simply saying is do not be deceived on salvation. There's only one way to get to heaven. The world's going to tell you there's many ways. The world's going to tell you there's many roads. But remember, Jesus is the only way. And he says a man must be born again. In John chapter 3, he says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, we're not all God's children. We are all God's creation. But in John 8, 44, he says, you are of, the, of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. You see, we are God's creation. We must be born again. We must be born into, the, the, born into God's family. We must be born into uh, his family to be born a child of the king, born into God's family. In John 1, 12, he says, But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you been born again? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Our eternal destination depends upon what we do with Jesus Christ. He's not going to make you get saved. He's not going to make you. He's given you a free will, but all I'm saying is do not be deceived. Get saved today. Moving on here, number two, do not deceive yourself about the word of God. Amen. Do not deceive yourself about the word of God. God did not give us the Bible as a form of entertainment. He did not give us the Bible just as a book to sit on the counter. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. God gave us the Bible so that we could know him, so that we could submit to his, his word, obey his word, and not just hear it, but do it. You see, it's all about the book. It's all about the Bible. The Bible is true. In Psalm 119, 128, he says, Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Do you hate every false way? Do you hate everything that God hates? Are you against everything God is against? Do not deceive yourself on the word of God. He has given us his message. It's a message of truth, and he's given it to us for us. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Listen, that's all scripture. That's not just the Old Testament or just the New Testament. It's both. It's all scripture. It's Genesis through Revelation. All scripture. He's preserved his word for us. For English-speaking people, that is, in the King James Bible. Anything other than the King James Bible is the devil's deception. And he's deceived thousands over the years with his different versions. Since 1900, there's been over 100 different translations of the Bible. Over 100. Why is that? Man doesn't like what it says. It doesn't fit their lifestyle. Hey, don't tell me that I'm a sinner. 
How many doors do you knock on and they slam the door in your face because you try to explain to them sin? Don't tell me I'm a sinner. Don't tell me there's a judgment. Hey, don't, don't, don't tell me any of that. I don't like what it says. Man doesn't like what it says. They want to change it. They want it to say what they want it to say. Turn with me over to Genesis, all the way back to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Yea, hath God said. Genesis chapter 3 in verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The devil made Eve believe that she could not understand the word of God without his interpretation. Yea, hath God said, He caused her to think that he could improve upon what God had already said. Yea, hath God said, just a little doubt, just casting just a little doubt on the word of God. How many false religions are there in the world today? Yea, hath God said, just a little bit, just twist it a little. Yea, hath God said, anytime you start putting doubt on truth, on the truth of of God's word, You're in trouble. You're on a slippery slope with no way to stop. Nothing is going to stop. When you change words, you're changing meanings to those words. God's word is true. It needs no altering. It needs no changes. It's been preserved for you and I today. It is a product of God. It is complete. The King James Bible is an every word Bible. Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Hey, if you're using some other version, some other English version, then you have fallen for the devils. Yea, hath God said. If you think this is just a book of rules and a book of guidelines that I have to listen to and do, then you have fallen for the devil's deception. And yea, hath God said. If you believe only part of the Bible is true, if you, if you separate the old and the new and it's not all scripture, if you believe the Bible has errors, then you believe the devil's deception. You've fallen for the devil's, yea, hath God said. If you are here today and you've not been obeying God's word, you've just been hearing it, you've not been doing it, then you too have fallen for the devil's deception. And yea, hath God said. In Psalm 119, 89, he says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. 2014, I got saved and I got sent to Korea. And I was in Korea in 2016. I turned 40 years old while I was over there. And I showed up, well, we showed up there. And we had no idea any of this that I just explained to you. I had no idea. Like I said, Brother Lewis's church was our first independent church. We showed up with wrong Bibles. I was 40 years old and never heard the truth of why you should have a King James Bible. But Brother Lewis sat down with us, and he had a bunch of verses printed off, and he he said, all right, look at this verse. This is what it says in the King James Bible. And he says, look at it in that thing you have. And so we looked at it. And uh, it wasn't the same. You know, they took things away like blood, Jesus' blood, the deity of Christ. All those things were taken out. And I couldn't believe it. I felt so deceived. And then we kept going on. And, and there were verses that weren't even in my thing and that, that were in the King James Bible. And I just couldn't believe it. I was deceived. I felt so horrible to be deceived. We took those things and we threw them away. And we got King James Bibles. 
Never had an issue since. You know, even my son Nolan, he was 10 years old at that time. When we told him about that, we saw him downstairs where we lived. They had a, a garbage area. We saw him downstairs. He was throwing his away, right? Ten-year-olds know truth. They can be taught truth, too. The book is absolute true. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Hey, the devil has not changed. He still uses those same, yea, hath God says, said today. Do not be deceived on the word of God. Number three, do not deceive yourself about creation. It's a hot topic in the world today. When it comes to creation, do not be deceived. You better have God's word. You better believe what God says about creation or you will be deceived. See, the world says Big Bang, Gap Theory, Evolution, but you must have God's position. Mine is Genesis 1-1. Where's yours? Where do you stand? Do you stand on Genesis 1-1? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Ever since the beginning of time, the devil's tried to attack that. If he can, if he can defeat Genesis 1-1, then you have nothing to stand on. If you do not stand on Genesis 1-1, there is nothing else of the Bible for you to stand on. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Exodus 20, 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all, that, <clears throat> and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Nehemiah 9, 6. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens. With all their hosts, the earth, and all the things that are therein, the seas, and all that is therein. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And we could go on all night and, and give you verses where God created. All I'm saying is do not be deceived on creation. Six literal 24-hour days, and he rested on the seventh day. I want you to turn here on, into Genesis chapter 1 on verse 26. <clears throat> verse 26 and 27. <clears throat> this is good stuff here. Pay attention to this. Verse 26, and God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. There's only two genders, folks. It says it right there. God's word is true. There's a male and there's a female. It's not like this guy in Great Britain that says there's over 150 different genders. He's a, a, nut, a nutcase, a wacko. There's only two, male and female. In all of creation, nobody's ever had such issues de determining male and female until today. Folks, there's only two. Do not be deceived. God made no mistakes. You were made a male. He meant for you to be a male. You were made a female. You were meant to be a female. That's it, period. No mistakes. There was a little girl who came home from school one day, and she asked her mother, Mommy, how did the human race come to be? The mother explained, well, God created male and female. He created Adam and Eve, and they had children, and so all the world came to be. The, the little girl goes to her father and asks her father the same thing. The father says, well, dear, there were monkeys, and we came from monkeys. The confused girl went back to her mother and said, Mom, why is it that when I asked you how the human race came to be, you said we were created by God? And when I asked Daddy, he said we were created by monkeys. Mother takes a deep sigh and says, Well, dear, it's quite simple. I was telling you about my side of the family, and your father was telling you about his side. <laughs> Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived, just a silly joke. We are created 
by God. We are created in the image of God. We were created for his glory. Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You and I were created to bring pleasure and glory to him. We weren't, he didn't want us to be around 100 years from now. He didn't want us to be around 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. He wanted us here right now, today, to bring glory to him. In this world, where we're at right now, regardless of everything that's going on in the world, regardless of everything that's going on in your life, you were brought here today to bring glory to God. How are you doing in that area? Are you bringing glory to God in everything you do? Are you bringing glory to God in, in your work life, in your home life, in your Christian life? Remember, the world's going to tell you to follow your heart. The world's going to tell you to, to trust your heart, acquire as much wealth as you can, to do whatever it is that fulfills your wildest dreams. In other words, the, words, the world's going to tell you that there is no God. The world is going to tell you you're your own God. Fulfill your own deepest dreams. But Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Because one day we all stand before him. We can't escape death. Death will come for everybody. Nobody will escape death. In Hebrews 9, 27, And as it is appointed on the man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Are you living your life for the one that created you? Are you living your life for the one that bled and died for you? Do not be deceived. Do not deceive yourself about salvation. Do not deceive yourself on the word of God. Do not deceive yourself on creation. And lastly here, do not deceive yourself on our mission. Yes, we have a mission. Our goal, our objective. Yes, we're here to please the Lord, to glorify the Lord. But one way we can do that is to be faithful to our mission, the great commission. There used to be a, an old TV show. It would start out with uh, one of the guys would say to another character, he'd say something along these lines. He'd say, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is. And he'd go about giving them his next mission. Well, Christian, our mission is to go to a lost and dying world and preach the gospel. Amen. But guess what? We do not get the choice to do it or to not do it. We cannot reject it. It is ours to take. We have to go and do it. It's not an option. It is a command. In Proverbs 11.30, he says, He that winneth souls is wise. Matthew 28.19, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. He doesn't say go into all the world and, and invite them to church, which is a good thing. We need to do that, but we need to be preaching the gospel. He doesn't go, say go into all the world and, and give your soul winning plan. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. We are to give the gospel. In Acts 1, 8, he says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. These are Jesus' last words on earth. And in verse 9, it says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Let Jesus' last words on earth He's telling us to go preach the gospel. It's not an option. We are commanded to go pull them from the fire. Jude likens it to a fire. In, in verse 22 and 23 he says, And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Listen, if our house caught on fire and our loved ones were inside, would you turn the other cheek? Would you say, I'm too busy with work today? I can't take care of that right now. Or would you just scroll through the phone a little bit more and say, I'll get to that later. I can't deal with that right now. The house is on fire. Our loved ones are inside. 
I don't think anybody would do that. None of us would. But look around. Look around Madison. Look around Huntsville. There are so many people around us in danger of fire, dropping off into hell and remaining there forever, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. 1.8 people per second pass on, just like that. Hey, none of us want that. None of us want anybody to go to hell. None of us want that. We know the truth, but are we preaching the gospel? Are we telling them how to get to heaven? Are we telling them that Jesus died for their sins? Are we doing that? The grocery store, that sweet dear lady that checks you out at the grocery store, our doctor's appointments, that neighbor we have, the hardest one of all, the family. The family, are we, are we preaching the gospel to our family? Hey, their, their house is on fire, folks. It's burning up. Time is running out. We don't know how long we have. 1.8. 1.8. So me and my wife have been doing the nursing home, the assisted living, you know, for a few years now, I guess. Started right before COVID. And I want to introduce you to my man, Frank. Uh, before COVID, he was a hard man. He was kind of a religious man. And we, I would invite him to come to the service, and Frank wouldn't come. He'd pretty much make fun of me, poke fun at me. And, uh, and then, obviously, COVID happened, and they shut us down. And it was quite a while before we were able to get back in. But once we got back in, went down to see Frank. Frank's wife had just passed away about three weeks earlier. Frank was a little bit of a different man. He wasn't as hard. He came to the service. He came up to me afterwards and he said, I enjoyed that service. I'm glad I came. I said, Frank, do you know if, you're go if you die, you go to heaven? Well, I just hope so. But, but he wouldn't talk to me. He just kind of walked away. So the next week came, invited him, and, 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 and Frank became the most faithful person in the assisted living. Every Sunday, Frank was there, the first one there and the last one to leave. Frank was the encouragement for me. One Sunday... Frank would sit off over here in, in the back, and one Sunday I preached, and I got done, and, and, I, and I just finished, and I walked up here, and, and I just happened to catch him out of the corner of my eye as he's, he's kind of coming up here really quick. Now, if you know the, the assisted living, the nursing home, two things. You never know what people are going to say, and you never know what they're going to do. I didn't know what he was going to do. The Holy Spirit took over. He got about from me to you, and I said... Frank, do you know if you die, you go to heaven? It was just the Holy Spirit. He just took over. And he says, no, I do not know. I said, Frank, would you like to know as he's getting closer? He says, yes, I'd like to know. My Bible's already out here. And I began showing Frank the verses that I've shared with you today. I just began asking him, Frank, what does this mean? Do you believe this? Do you believe you're a sinner? Just going through everything. Do you believe that Jesus died for you? Yes. You went through everything. I said, well, Frank... You believe all that. Would you like to trust Christ today to know you're going to heaven when you die? He says, yes, I don't want to go to hell. So I said, okay, Frank, I'm going to say a prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over to you, and you just call on the Lord to save you. So I prayed, and he prayed. I turned it over to him, and he said a couple things, kind of mumbling through, you know, and, and then he says, clear as day, Jesus save me. He said, Jesus save me. Oh, I was just rejoicing with him that day. He called on the Lord, and, and we were rejoicing with him. And, and that took a lot of courage because there was still about 20 people sitting down while all of this is taking place. We rejoiced with him that day, and we left, and we were rejoicing with him. But you know what happened? A couple of days later, Frank had a heart attack, a massive stroke, and he died. That was the last time I saw Frank that time. And no doubt that was the last time he heard the gospel. I, I, I will guarantee it. But I heard him with his voice, with his words, call on the Lord to save him. Amen. Praise the Lord. All I'm saying, don't be deceived on salvation. We have a mission. We need to go to that lost and dying world and preach the gospel. Be ye doers of the word, 
not hearers only. So as I wrap this up here, as I conclude, have you been deceiving yourselves? Has the Lord showed you some areas? Have you been a doer of the word? Are you a hearer only? We do not want to deceive ourselves. Do you obey all of God's word? Are you holding anything back tonight? Are you holding anything back from God? First things first, though, are you born again? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? That's the most important question you have to ask. Ask yourself. Are you going to heaven when you die? If not, we can get that settled today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. We do thank you for this day you've given. Lord, I thank you for your message. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truths, Lord. And I just thank you so much for, for uh, giving me this opportunity again today. But I just pray, Lord, that you'll, you'll speak to hearts. Lord, if there's anybody that's not saved, Lord, I pray you convict them of their sin and of righteousness and of judgment and that they will come forward today to be saved. Maybe there's somebody here who's been struggling with being a doer of the word. Lord, I just encourage them that today they can get that right and walk holy with you. And Lord, uh, I just pray, pray you'll bless in this invitation now as we sing a couple hymns. In Jesus' name, amen.